This really happened to me. I was told that I was insulin resistant, but at the time I didn't have any of the tools that I have today. So it ended up taking me two years to get rid of my insulin resistance. Bottom line, this is what I would do today if I wanted to stop insulin resistance inside of 30 days. And I know you've been in this spot before because a lot of people battle with this and you actually clicked on this video. So if you're feeling like groggy after eating or you're having a bunch of unexplained hormonal changes, maybe you're gaining weight, you're gaining visceral belly fat, you're not sleeping well, you're having all these problems even when you're eating what you've been told you should be eating. Your doctor thinks you're lying, but you're not. Bottom line is, what if I told you that you could not only stop the slide into poor metabolic health, but you could actually reverse it starting today? It sounds overly cheeky and almost hypey, but the reality is these playbooks are pretty simple. The key isn't just about eating less. It's really more about strategically implementing what you eat and when you eat it. Okay, eating less matters, but if you can force your cells to become exquisitely sensitive to insulin again, and you can time things properly, you can take control back. So today we're not talking about theories. We're talking about hard science. We're talking about a tactical battle plan. So if I suddenly found myself insulin resistant again, and I had the tools that I have today, this is the exact science-backed protocol I would follow to ultimately reclaim my health. So here's what we're gonna cover today. We're gonna talk about what's called the carb threshold. So we'll look at the hard data there, the dose-dependent relationship between carbs and insulin resistance. We're gonna talk about the circadian part. So we're gonna discover how when you eat is just as critical as what you eat. We're gonna dive into a really interesting study there. We're gonna talk about exercise intensity and duration. We're gonna talk about how a short, intense workout that's strategically timed can actually be really powerful at helping to reverse insulin resistance. And we're gonna talk strategic supplementation. So I'll give you a short list. The short list really of the powerful science-backed compounds and sort of a mitochondrial peptide, if you wanna go that route, that can really target insulin resistance in a unique way. And then we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of the fat factor. We're gonna talk about saturated fats versus seed oils, what's noise, what matters, because it does play a role in metabolic health. We're gonna talk about what might actually help you to restore metabolic function. So as a typical Thomas DeLauer fashion, let's jump into the mechanisms first. So the first and most immediate action, if someone is told that they have insulin resistance that I would tell them personally, is to start altering carbohydrate intake. And I know that puts you into a dogmatic crowd, I get it, but this isn't really a suggestion in my book, it's a necessity. Because no matter what the cause is, this is one of the fastest stop gaps you can put in place. The relationship between carbs and insulin resistance is direct and quantifiable. It does not mean that carbs are bad, but the carbohydrate load does matter. It's legitimately quantifiable. There was a very powerful study in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition back in 2021. It showed this super clear, okay? They took individuals who had already lost weight and they split them into three separate groups. They ate the same amount of protein, but with different carb intakes. So there was a 60% carb diet, a 40% carb diet, and a 20% carb diet. They measured insulin resistance with what is called a lipoprotein insulin resistance score, okay, LPIR. This is kind of used in those kinds of settings. So in scientific terms, this LPIR score is validated as a biomarker, and it reflects insulin resistance by quantifying the size and concentration, get this, of all kinds of crazy stuff. So of their, what's called their VLDL, their LDL, and their HDL, lipoprotein particles, okay? We know LDL and HDL, obviously. So in other words, it's an accurate way to see how your body is handling fats and sugars without doing what's called an insulin clamp where you really have to, it's invasive, right? So a lower score means more resistance. And the study found a dose-dependent relationship with carbs and a worse score. So the higher the carb intake, the worse the LPIR score. The 60% carb group had the highest insulin resistance and the 20% group had the lowest. The takeaway is unequivocal. Okay, lowering your carbohydrate intake does improve insulin sensitivity. Doesn't mean that there are not other ways to do it. Of course not, there's definitely other ways to do it. But when someone says reduce carbohydrates to improve insulin sensitivity, we're not blowing smoke. This is real. Doesn't mean there's not other ways, but it's real. But what if you're already past the initial stage, right? What if you're a little bit beyond insulin resistance and you're actually pre-diabetic, which is a slippery, like a thin line anyway. There is a 2022 study in JAMA that looked at this. So they took 150 people with pre-diabetes, so advanced insulin resistance, put half of them on a low carb diet. And in this case, they targeted less than 40 grams of net carbs for three months and then less than 60 for the next three. The other half just ate their usual diet. The results here were literally staggering. Okay, the low carb group saw significant reductions in their HbA1c. They saw reductions in their fasting glucose and they ultimately lost body weight and body fat. 
whereas the usual diet group saw zero zilch improvement. Okay, and this tells us that a sustained low carb approach isn't a band aid. This is a powerful tool that potentially reverses the progression towards a more advanced state. So just controlling your carbs is only one piece of the puzzle though. We need to talk about something called cell membrane flexibility for a moment. This is really important here. Your cells are sensitive to the types of fuel they get in. And if you have a very flexible cell, it's prone to more oxidative stress. So what happens, we're gonna talk about this more in depth when we get towards the end of this video because it's really important, but a high amount of oxidated fats, like poor quality oils that have been sitting out, that makes a difference. Okay, low quality soybean oil from fast food or from processed foods, this actually affects the cell membrane and makes it so that it cannot receive the signal properly. It leads to a more stressed out, oxidative stress cell that has a dysfunctional mitochondria and cannot handle fuel properly. That is why I'm a huge fan of consuming good quality saturated fat, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Goat cheese, Pecorino Romano, Pecorino Sarda, these kinds of high quality cheeses, which again, we'll talk in more detail. I put a link down below for something I recommend too. They've extracted essentially these fats from this kind of cheese in a synthetic way. So it ends up being vegan as well. It's called C15. It's from a company called Fatty15. There's a lot of Navy funded research behind this. This is a really powerful tool in the world of metabolic health, longevity, and insulin resistance. I put a link down below. It's a special discount. It's a 15% off discount link for Fatty15. Just do the research, take a look at them. I think you'll find this is an essential fat that our cells need and it probably will help you out. It's just an added tool, right? It's something that I wish I had 12, 13 years ago when I was insulin resistant. It would have made a big difference because I didn't understand the idea behind like saturated fat, low quality fats and how it affected insulin resistance. I thought it was all sugar. So that link, it's in the top line of the description underneath this video. But I wanna talk about something that's really even more powerful than probably anything of that you actually eat. It's not what you eat, it's when you eat. So let's talk about timing. So if you shorten your daily eating window, this is one of the most profoundly effective strategies. The science really shows it very clear. It's not about how much you eat all the time. That definitely matters. But really when you eat does matter too. It makes a big difference. There was a landmark study that was in cell metabolism and it investigated what's called early time-restricted feeding or ETRF. I've talked about this a lot. Maybe you've heard me talk about it. But in this study, they took a group of men with prediabetes and they had them eat all their meals within a six-hour window. And dinner had to be before 3 p.m., which is weird, I know. But they compared this to a standard 12-hour eating window just to see what would happen. And the results were out of this world. Okay, so the early eating window, improved insulin sensitivity, like almost off the charts. Beta cell responsiveness, which is essentially your pancreas's ability to produce insulin improved, blood pressure improved, and their oxidative stress improved. So they basically had an anti-aging effect. And the piece that's so fascinating with this is that the insulin levels were radically decreased in every single participant on the early eating schedule, except for one person. And that one person, they had a long history of overnight shift work. The point here is that this points to a really powerful thing. Circadian rhythm alignment is key. Your cells operate on a 24 hour clock. So that one person was all out of whack because they were working shift work. So your body is most insulin sensitive and metabolically active in the morning. Hands down, point blank, no question. In other words, the carbs that you eat at 9 a.m. are handled completely differently than the same carbs eaten at 9 p.m. So by front loading your nutrition, you're working with your body's natural metabolic rhythm. Okay, you're giving your body fuel when its engine is running at its peak. Like, so if you're fasting, it's one thing, but if you're not fasting, stack your calories towards the morning. You're giving your body fuel when its engine is running at its peak. This is super important. And it also ends up, if you do this, it creates a longer fasting window during the evening and overnight. So if you eat earlier, then you have a longer fasting period. And that way you're already insulin resistant more so in the evening. So you're sort of like eliminating that risk by not eating during those times. So a couple of days a week, eat dinner super early. Okay, I mean, it sounds crazy, but your health is more important than what people think of you eating dinner a little early a couple of days a week. So this break from insulin tells your cells to essentially reset and they become sensitive again. And it ends up maximizing fat breakdown. And this ends up 
further combating insulin resistance because body fat contributes to insulin resistance in the first place. So the practical takeaway with this part is simple. Eat earlier in the day and finish your last meal long before you go to bed as often as possible. Plain and simple. Now we know exercise is critical and our doctors will tell us to eat less and move more and exercise. But if your goal is to rapidly take care of insulin resistance, the kind of exercise that gives you the most bang for the buck, the one that the data points the most strongly towards, is focusing on the right kind of intensity. Logically, you're gonna think that lower intensity, maybe long duration aerobic cardio is best because it burns a high percentage of fat, and that's true. It is good for that, but when you're insulin resistant, the primary problem is that your muscle cells are not good at taking up glucose. We need to fix that directly. So there was a study that was published in Obesity Research and Clinical Practice, okay, and it compared short duration, high intensity exercise, so 20 minutes at 70 to 80% heart rate reserve with long duration, low intensity, like 60 minutes at like 40% heart rate reserve. So in normal weight people, both types of exercise improved insulin resistance almost equally. But here's the kicker. In the obese and metabolically unhealthy group, only the high intensity exercise significantly improved insulin resistance. They both helped, okay? But why is this? It comes down to really the cellular level within your muscle. Okay, there was a BMJ study that took a look at this and it found that high intensity interval training, so HIIT training, ends up inducing a massive increase in what's called GLUT4. In scientific terms, GLUT4 is the insulin regulated glucose transporter in skeletal muscle and actually in fat too. But basically, high intensity exercise triggers these contractions of the muscle and it causes this GLUT4 to go to the top of the cell membrane without insulin being needed. Okay, so independent of insulin. Now what happens with this, in other words, intense exercise moves the glucose gate to the surface of your muscle and that allows it to suck up sugar from your bloodstream without needing a big surge of insulin. So the studies show that HIT increases GLUT4 content by get this 260%, so a 260% increase in the gate opening up. You're literally building more doorways, more garage doors for glucose to get out of your blood and into your muscles. This is literally how you can directly combat insulin resistance at the actual source. But let's talk about some targeted tools that you can use to maybe accelerate this process, right? Because this is lifestyle stuff, it's great, but I'm just trying to help you cut through the noise. But there's some fun stuff. Like I did a video recently on this one, like cinnamon. Okay, this isn't just a spice. There was a huge umbrella meta-analysis in diabetology and metabolic syndrome. It looked at 11 different large meta-analysis. So it was an umbrella looking at big studies, right? And they found all these randomized controlled trials and the conclusion was very clear. Cinnamon has a significant effect on reducing fasting glucose, insulin, and insulin resistance, period. And the mechanisms are multifaceted. We focus on some of the big ones, but really, first off, it inhibits digestive enzymes. So it basically slows the breakdown of carbs into sugar, which blunts blood sugar spikes. This is good for anybody, really. Secondly, it's a powerful antioxidant in itself. So it stops the activation of what's called nuclear factor kappa B. It really is literally the master switch for inflammation. So it turns this off so we have less inflammation. That's a big part of obviously insulin resistance. And most importantly, there's something called cinnamaldehyde that's in cinnamon. And this directly improves the function of the insulin receptor itself, making it so that it receives the signal from insulin significantly better. I also wanna make sure that you're using Ceylon cinnamon. Okay, Ceylon cinnamon is a safer bet. Other cinnamons can be toxic. So do a little research on that. I'll save that for another time. In fact, uh, towards the end of this video, I'll link out to my cinnamon video. It explains a little more. Next, there's a peptide. Okay, it's a fascinating compound. This is something you have to talk to a doctor about. This stuff has worked well for me, but it's called MOTS-C. This is a mitochondrial-derived peptide. So there was a study in cell metabolism that found that MOTS-C was able to actually prevent some of the age-related and high-fat diet-induced insulin resistance. It directly affects the mitochondria. So the mechanism here is it activates AMPK in the muscle. This is the energy sensor inside our skeletal muscle. So in other words, this MOTC peptide flips a switch in your muscles, and that does two things. It tells the cell to move those GLUT4 glucose gates to the surface to take up more sugar, and it enhances fat utilization, oxidation. So it's powerful. Okay? It's naturally occurring peptide that really improves metabolic function at the mitochondrial level, but this is something you do need to talk to a physician about, but it's something that I think is worth mentioning at a like a mitochondrial deep fundamental level that is super important. I'd also add TMG to the mix. TMG is trimethylglycine and it helps with reducing oxidative stress, okay? And it helps with reducing 
uh, a little bit of what's called glycation, but I'll have another one for that too. So look up betaine or trimethylglycine. This is something where a couple grams of this stuff has a really powerful effect. The evidence is really strong on it. Another supplement just to add in the mix is something called carnosine. This is where five or six grams of carnosine, it's not the cheapest supplement, but it can help stop what is called glycation, which is the formation and the combination of sugars and proteins in your bloodstream that causes immense oxidative stress and blocks the cell from being able to use glucose just by creating a high stress environment in the blood. That's a simple way of putting, okay? But those two supplements, TMG, carnosine, and then the spice of cinnamon and the peptide, if you go the advanced route, these are things that I would use if I was, if I knew about them. Some of them are pulling out all the stops, but they're effective. Finally, we have to talk about fats. First off, I'm going to tell you straight up, reduce your low quality oil intake. Oils like soybean oil, corn oil, canola oil. Okay, these are what are called polyunsaturated fats, which are fine because linoleic acid is fine. It's just the fact that these are low quality and typically oxidized. The problem is that the double bonds in these fats are highly susceptible to oxidation, especially when they're heated. And they're in a lot of processed foods. And when you heat them or when they sit on a shelf, they become problematic. When you consume these oils, what happens is they get incorporated into your LDL particles. What happens is then you end up with LDL that's very prone to becoming oxidized LDL. There was a study in pediatric diabetes that found a direct correlation between levels of oxidized LDL and insulin resistance, even in children. Okay, this isn't an age thing. Oxidized LDL is a problem and the mechanism is simply inflammatory. Oxidized LDL activates the immune system, immune cells, and it causes them to release these pro-inflammatory cytokines. We call uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, interleukin-6, IL-6, some of these other ones, IL-1 beta. So these cytokines then directly interfere with insulin signaling pathways, and this inhibits a key protein called ERS-1. So this is insulin receptor substrate. So oxidized LDL ends up causing what's called endothelial dysfunction. So it's reducing blood flow, it's reducing glucose delivery, all to the muscles and to the cells that need the glucose. The best bet is just reduce that stuff, okay? Nothing wrong with olive oil. Go for monounsaturated fats, olive oil, avocado oil, even sesame oil is okay. It has antioxidants that protect it. But then what about saturated fat? Because this is where things get confusing. Like is saturated fat a problem? The first study that we talked about in the beginning showed that a low carb, high saturated fat diet still improved insulin resistance. So the nuance is critical, okay? The type of saturated fat matters. So short chain fats like butyrate, for example, these are considered a saturated fat and they're anti-inflammatory, like in ghee and things like that. Medium chain fats and coconut oil can also improve insulin sensitivity. The problems often arise from excessive consumption of long chain saturated fat, like palmitic acid. This is gonna be in junk food and stuff like that. This can trigger fat accumulation in the muscle and the liver. It can trigger inflammation via a bunch of different, like what's called toll-like receptor pathways. It's a real thing, but, it's really more about the combination of these high saturated fat diets along with high carbs. It's a very different beast if your carbs are lower. It doesn't mean go pounding saturated fats, but it means it's not as problematic as we probably thought. And there's another long chain saturated fat. It's called C15. I actually mentioned it earlier. This is in like goat cheese and stuff. This has been shown to be beneficial. It actually improves the stability of your cell membranes. So this is vital for the proper function of the insulin receptor. It also seems like it can block inflammation in certain ways and reduce the downstream effects of inflammatory compounds and oxidative stress. So the main takeaway, eliminate the processed industrial fats, eliminate the trans fats that are in fried foods and the baked foods. That stuff's a big no-no. Focus on the stable, like naturated saturated fats in the context of low carbohydrate whole foods, right? So cheeses, good quality cheese, aged cheeses, Pecorino Romano, Parmesan. Let's recap this whole battle plan so it all makes sense. Okay, you're going to drastically reduce carbohydrate intake as an immediate stopgap. Carbs can come back, but we need to bring them to a low level. I want you to eat in an early shortened window to align with your circadian rhythm. Then I want you to prioritize high intensity exercise, just 10, 15 minutes a few days per week of higher intensity to increase that glute four translocation in your muscles. I want you to use targeted spices like cinnamon, supplements like TMG and carnosine, Consider using mot C if you can talk to a doctor. I want you to eliminate inflammatory seed oils and be strategic about saturated fat sources. It's not about managing a condition. This is about taking decisive science-backed action 
to fix a broken system. So you can actually lose the weight, clear the brain fog, and get the energy back. I put a link right here for you to check out that video I talked about on cinnamon. I feel like this is important so you know how to use cinnamon in the context of insulin resistance. I think it'll help you out a lot. And if this breakdown was useful, do me a favor, hit the subscribe button. I'll see you in the next video.